The Bible Manuscript Society presents the 1524 Mikraod Gdalot, or Second Rabbinic Bible. The Mikraod Gdalot, or in English, the Second Rabbinic Bible, was produced by Jacob ben Chaim, also known as Yaakov ben Chaim ibn Adonijah. The Mikraod Gdalot was published by Daniel Bomberg in Venice in 1524 to 1525, and is a classic printing of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Masoretic text. The Mikraod Gdalot of Ben Chaim is believed to have been used by the translators of the King James Version of the Bible in 1611 as the source text or textus receptus of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Mikraod Gdalot or Second Rabbinic Bible was produced and edited by Jacob Ben Chaim. He was a Jewish Masoretic scholar who converted, possibly out of necessity, to Christianity. He compiled all the elements of the Mikraot Gdolot, including the following individual elements. 1. The Hebrew and Aramaic text of the Tanakh or Old Testament according to the Masorah, including the Hebrew letters, the vocalization, and the Te'amim or cantillation marks. 2. The Hebrew Masorah, Ritic notes on the biblical text. 3. The Aramaic Targums. And 4. In addition to Targum Onkelos and Rashi's commentary, the standard Jewish commentaries on the Hebrew Bible, there are other biblical commentaries, the most common and prominent being medieval commentaries in the Peshat tradition. The Mikraod Gdolot, or Second Rabbinic Bible, was a monumental achievement of typesetting for its day, given that the printing press was new and all the Hebrew letters, vowels and accents had to be meticulously and individually assembled into place. Ben Chaim used the best Hebrew manuscripts that were available to him. Although some have argued that he did not always have access to the best manuscripts, the famous Masoretic scholar Ginsberg has argued that it was a good representation of the Ben Asher text. In fact, Ginsberg's own superb editions of the Hebrew Bible, printed by the British and Foreign Bible Society, were based on Ben Chaim's Second Rabbinic Bible. The Second Rabbinic Bible, or Mikraot Gdolot, was published in four volumes. The first volume contains the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. The second volume contains the books of Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. The third volume contains all the former and latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. The fourth volume contains the books of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. The Mikraod Gdolot, or Second Rabbinic Bible of Ben Chaim, served as the standard text of the Hebrew Bible for nearly all later editions until modern times. It is widely recognised as an extraordinary achievement. Despite this, objections have been raised by Jewish readers due to the fact that the first printing of the Mikraot Gdolot, or the first rabbinic Bible, was edited by Felix Pretensis, a Jew converted to Christianity. The publisher of the second rabbinic Bible was Daniel Bomberg, also a Christian convert from Judaism, and he had requested an imprimatur from the Pope. Thus, Jewish criticism of the second rabbinic Bible is largely because it was not entirely the work of Jews, and Christian converts were involved. However, the history of the times must also be understood. All religious published books in the 1500s required explicit authority from the Pope, and the publishing of books was impossible without the Pope's agreement. These conditions also applied, for example, to the Complutensian Polyglot Bible and Erasmus's editions of the Greek New Testament. The Mikraot Gdolot, or Second Rabbinic Bible of Ben Chaim, is widely accepted as a well-produced, superior, and textually accurate edition of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. It was made from the best manuscripts that were available to Ben Chaim, and great care was taken into its typesetting and production. It has stood the test of time, and was used by all subsequent translations of the Old Testament right up until modern times, when the Leningrad Codex is generally used. The Mikraot Gdolot, or Second Rabbinic Bible, can be used to compare the text of the Hebrew Bible in printed Bibles today with medieval texts, with the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex, and with the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
These comparisons show that the text of the Hebrew Bible has been preserved faithfully down through the centuries. Any differences are very minor, generally affecting the te'amim or cantillation marks rather than the Hebrew letters themselves. Further, very detailed and accurate information on the manuscript traditions of the Hebrew Bible is contained in the classic reference work of Christian David Ginsburg, Introduction to the Masoretic Critical Edition of the Hebrew Bible in two volumes. Following this introduction, let's take a closer look at the Second Rabbinic Bible to gain further insights into this historically important witness of the Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh. Okay, so here is the Second Rabbinic Bible. Let's just look at a few things that are interesting about it. First of all, if we start just looking at the whole page, just flip down a few pages and we can see what the overall um, pages look like. So here on the first introductory page, in general everything is very elaborate, there's great detail and time and care has been taken to typeset this. Remember this was typeset shortly after the printing press was introduced and at that time people were thinking in terms of years to typeset a book, not like modern books where you take days to typeset a book, all electronically done on computer. Every single page had to be individually, painstakingly done. So we can see right away that a great deal of time and care and attention has been given. Every page almost as a work of art that would have taken lots of time to do. But if we scroll down a few pages, we can see some a note to the reader. We can see some other material here. We can see a table here of all the parashot, etc. But if we go down to Genesis, um, here we are in Genesis. So in big letters here it says Bereshit, meaning Genesis, or in the beginning. And also each introduction to each book has a very ornate heading here. And in general we can see several things here. This is the Hebrew text. So Bereshit, Bara Elohim et Hashemayim ve'et Haaretz. And here is the Targum Onkelos, Bekad Min. We can actually see it easier if we go on to the next page. So we can see here we have the Hebrew text, which is bigger than the Aramaic text. So on the left here is the Hebrew in bigger writing, and the Aramaic on the right in slightly smaller writing. Here in the middle, in the margin, is the Hebrew Masora, and up here we can see Rashi, which is um, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, which is the Jewish commentator, classic Jewish commentator, and Ibn Ezra, who is another classic medieval commentary. So if we just scroll into those two pages in a little bit more detail, first of all. So here is the second Bereshit at the top here, and we can see the added title Tohu Vavohu. So there are several interesting things here. The Hebrew text is always given more emphasis, so it's slightly bigger. And this is the Hebrew text, it's also the vowel points, there's also these little circles that appear are references to Masoretic notes in the margin. Also all the cantillation marks are here. So you can see that an immense amount of time and care has been taken to typeset this. So it wasn't done electronically, no computers in, those age, in that age. Every single character, every vowel point, everything had to be systematically put into place. So there's a huge amount of time and care. This is Targum Onkelos, the Aramaic Targum translation on the right. And here we have the Masoretic notes, more Masoretic notes here. But we can see in Rashi, this commentary is not in standard Hebrew characters, it's in Rashi script. And the same with the Ibn Ezra commentary. And if we just go up to the start of Genesis, put a sheet here. And again, if we just scroll, we can start to see just how much time and care has been taken here. The Masoretic notes here, the footnotes, the marginal notes here. A huge amount of effort and time and care has been taken. But if we just um, scroll down a few pages, let's get the whole context of the page in, where you can see the whole context of a page. And if we just scroll down a few pages, you know, the right and left of the page start to flip. So the Hebrew letters here on the left, on the next page, the Hebrew is bigger on the right. But you can see just how perfect, how beautiful the page was. The Hebrew text, the Aramaic text, the Masoretic footnotes, the Jewish commentaries, 
a huge amount of time and care has been taken to produce this. And the second rabbinic Bible remained for hundreds of years, right up until comparatively modern times, probably just a hundred years ago, before the Leningrad Codex started to become more useful as the basis for what people took as a standard Hebrew text. So this has really stood the text test of time. If I just go to a page here, and go to page 120, which I happen to know is the end of Genesis, and I'll just scroll in so you can see the context of the whole page. And again, we can see here, I he is the, the last parasha, but if we scroll down, we see the tail end of Ibn Ezra's commentary, the tail end of Rashi's commentary. But if we just go to the very end of the page here, it says the word Chazak, but this little footnote here is a Masoretic footnote on the total number of different Sederim, the different number of Parashot. It's just a commentary, little footnotes, on all these little minuscule details that the Masoretes counted. And in traditional Masoretic Hebrew Bibles, you'll find all these comments uh, reproduced. This is how the Masoretes managed to um, make sure that the text wasn't corrupted in any way. It's also interesting, you can see here that the margins line up, so the margin here lines up perfectly, and the margin here lines up perfectly. So obviously in those days there was no computerised justification, so they managed to do that by sometimes making the letters a little bit longer, like here, or sometimes some letters in Masoretic Bibles are slightly larger for various reasons, but the time and care to individually typeset all this must have been just absolutely incredible. If we go on to the next page, this is Shemot now, or Exodus, the Ele Shemot. And again, we see here, this is the start of Exodus. So again, it's a nice ornate title. And we then start to have, again, the Hebrew text here and the Targum here. And if you just scroll down again, we can see the familiar Rashi and Ibn Ezra commentaries. But the layout on these pages is very similar where we can see the whole page and as we scroll down there's either more writing or less writing and more commentary or less commentary depending on how big the commentaries are. So here there's only a small amount of Hebrew text and Aramaic whereas on the next page there's a lot of Hebrew and a smaller amount of Aramaic because the commentary is less here. So this is a traditional Jewish feature that the Hebrew and Aramaic text is in the middle with commentaries around it and that format is something which would later be adopted by printed editions of the Talmud, for example. So this is Jacob ben Chaim, Second Rabbinic Bible. It comes in four volumes, but in its day it was just a masterpiece of typesetting. It would have taken years to typeset this, and it stood the test of time for hundreds of years. Even to this day we can compare Hebrew Bibles to it, and it's incredibly accurate incredibly well preserved, a huge amount of time and effort has been taken to, to typeset this. So take a good look at it, it really is a beautiful work of art in addition to a reliable Hebrew Bible.